And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the bane of my fucking existence. <laughs> brother Xanatrix. We are back with the valley. Hang on. Sorry, something went down the wrong pipe. Um, and, you know, after the disappointment that was Level Up, which I've been getting emails left and right about the, about the fact that they're gearing up for the uh, Kickstarter for level, for level Up 5e. I, I just... still want to see something come of their one comment on our finale. I want to see that affect something. If they watched it enough to leave a, a, a comment like, Blimey. I want to see it make a drastic change. Well, uh, until then, I decided that I needed to balance things out, much like how I did with going through Legend of the Elements after we suffered through the Avatar quick start. So, and I, I was debating about what would be a, what would be the closest thing to a, to a similar level of rules hackery. That could that could be covered in that regard. I had thought about covering spheres of power and might for this, but I want to save that for another day. That's going to be a little more involved anyway. So, mm -hmm. but then I remember then I remembered that I had covered something that it that is that is kind of taking the five E tool set and hacking it. I've well I've co I've covered two technically. Um, one of them being low fantasy gaming, which I like low fantasy gaming, but for the purposes of look of looking at a rules hack, that's that doesn't go f quite the level that we'd want. It's just slightly skewing the rule set so that it can be done for more well low fantasy gaming. It's in the name on the tin. And but um, heavens and heresies. I think provides a far more interesting challenge because of the fact that it is that it is attempting to address some some issues and also have a a proper um, play style as opposed as opposed to a jack of as opposed to a jack of all trades master of one kind of thing and this and for this instead last time around we we had gone PDF by PDF. Given that Heavens and Heresies is technically still in alpha, I'm not comfortable with doing that per se. So what's going to end up happening is we're going to be tackling this in a series of phases, if you will. Um, We're the new MCU, guys. Well, we we kind of we kind of hinted at start at starting up a at a starting at how we'd start up a phase four when we did the reconstruction of Captain Marvel. So it fits. <laughs> when we can out Marvel Marvel. I mean that's not a little high bar, but still. But for phase one we're mostly gonna cover the the um basic the basic stuff, then go then go into ancestries and backgrounds because that'll be easy to cover. Phase two will be all about the classes. I I am not a hundred percent sure if if all of them are gonna be debt are gonna get their own video. Some of, for some of them, there may not, there may not be enough to do that, and in those cases, we'll um we'll compress. Um, phase three is going to cover the be the um sec the secondary material when it comes to characters, um equipment, art artistries, which we'll get to that feats, and of course magic. Um, I'm fairly certain magic is going to be it is going to be its own video all 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 on its own. And we'll finally have a magic system to work with, though. Yeah, <laughs> and phase four will just be our will just be our final thoughts on on everything that we've seen thus far. Now, given that um, I do need I do need to put in a couple I do I do need to put one bit of disclosure and one big ass asterisk. I'll start with the asterisk first. This project, Heavens and Heresies, is currently in alpha. So take. Every single thing that we say with a big ass grain of salt. 
Like the kind that would be put on the back of a mule as it's carrying carrying it out of the salt mines. Secondly, or the kind, or the kind that those uh, shitty hippie girls put on top of lights and think make them special. Mm-hmm. Secondly, um, the creator of this project, Tanner, is a, is a friend of the temple, and a, and I have had him on for in, for an interview at least once. It's norm, and if I was doing a review in in the gaming monk review fashion, I would probably bring I would probably bring that up. In that in that in that particular um, format, simply simply because well I have to, I have to make sure to maintain my sense of ethics, and uh, what a fortuitous what a fortuitous day to do it on this day, my seven year anniversary of being Mildra. Indeed, because um, on this on this day seven years ago, I put out the very first episode of Gaming Monk Review. Mm-hmm. I um I don't recommend anyone go back and watch it. My, <laughs> my recording setup was shit. My editing was shit, and I had no idea what I was doing, and I was just rambling about trying to go chapter by chapter. There's a reason I stopped that. <clears throat> but um uh, he- he hadn't established his format and MO yet. Now now he's practiced enough and slaughtered enough tabletop games on the altar of gaming that uh, he's got the practice to extract the heart with the minimum amount of effort. In my, in my defense, when I started, there were very, very few, um, at very few structured reviews of tabletop games. A lot of the reviews that I found were structured more like vlogs, and because because of, seven go ahead seven years ago that makes sense mm-hmm. because seven years ago tabletop hadn't like it was starting to touch mainstream but it still hadn't gotten the widespread acclaim that it's gotten to in more recent years. Even now, I'd say structured reviews of. TRPGs are still in that um, vlog style format, um, especially especially the re- especially the closest thing to reviewers that I was watching at the time. Um, that being that being guys like Esper and Click Clack Bang, mm-hmm. also known as the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming, who I haven't I haven't seen much of his stuff in years. Mainly, be- mainly because he decided to focus solely on doing on doing White Wolf shit, which is all well is all well and good. But the re- but the reason I ended- I even knew about him in the first place is he was one of the few people I knew who, bes- besides besides you and I, who even knew what the fuck Anima was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he also Monk. really really hates Heroes Unlimited. Not that, I, not that I can blame him, because yeah, let's take let's take the most broken ass system that can bear that can barely handle its own settings, and that's and then let's give it superheroes. Mm-hmm. But I but I digress. We'll st- we will st- we will start with we will start our little journey into heavens and heresies with the fact that now keep. Something to keep in mind is that this is, at the end of the day, an extensive hack of the D20 system for um, for 5th edition. It's important to keep that in the back of your mind as we, as we go through this, in case you see anything that is going to be familiar. Um, and I'd like to open up with... with with reading with reading what with reading what he said as the most important thing. The most important thing is to have fun. That's it. This is a game. To those who are new here, welcome. This game is still in its very early stages. Most of the mechanics listed here are oriented towards getting playtests running, so the more astute of you will notice that there's very little aid included for the GM. Fret not. This will this will not always be the case, but since I, your beautiful, illustrious, and sleep-deprived dev, am the forever GM in the playtest sessions, I have stored a great wealth of mechanics in my head and in my notebook to be compiled into a dock at a later time. 
Also keep in mind that every mechanic presented here should be viewed as a building block, something with which to tinker or a foundation rather than the, an actual finished mechanic. I am working on building the structures of this game first, adding in the basics and expanding upon them later. So if you see something that could be expanded upon, I will be happy to hear the ways in which you think could be expanded slash changed slash modified, assuming, of course, you are familiar with the other mechanics of the game on which it relies. And he also added a change log. We will not be covering the change log. <laughs> I don't think that's necessary either. I uh, I took a look at it. I'm like, hmm, that's quite quite a lot of changes. Now, after that goes the introductory dev note, which um, co which covers what you might expect it to. But one one part that I want to I want to delve into is the but why. Where he says, some of you might ask why. Why go through all this trouble of making this game that feels similar to another game that will remain nameless? The answer is, because there were aspects of that of that game I really liked. They were good base mechanics from which to build from, but there were also things that were not fun for me or my group. In making the game fun for us, I ended up making this one. That's it. Nothing really more complex than that. I just wanted to make a game that my friends and I would have fun playing, and this is it. The more astute of you will notice that. While on first appearance, this game might look and feel like the other, the core mechanical changes are extensive to the degree that it is a very different game, both in design and playability. And then after that, a, sum a summary on chapters, which will, which will be gotten to in a moment. Um, then we get to the core rules. And for all intents and purposes, the core, ru the core rule set and the core abilities are exactly the same as they are in. Well, I, I I take that slightly back. The if there's one thing that's changed, it's the naming conventions with the ability scores. We have instead of the basic six, we have strength, which more or less works the same, dexterity, which more or less works the same, constitution, again, intuition instead of intelligence. Which ha which which ha which has oh which is described as intuition measures the force of a character's of a, or a creature's personality and their ability to intuit so to speak information in a general way. Creatures with high intuition scores are better able to naturally grasp and evaluate situations as they unfold around them and can more easily attune with the forces of nature. Um, this is this this ends up measuring things like focus which is equal to your intuition modifier plus your wits modifier plus your resolve modifier minimum 2. Um let's see initiative a initiative bonus Inter interesting since yeah, yeah the initiative bonus that would normally be in dexterity is in intuition in inter it's that which is an interesting change and um and determines how many magic items you can attune to at any given time which Means that you means that you won't have the fighter decked out in all in all of the magic gear, or the whole party decked out in Diablo levels of magic gear. Um, eh, wits, which I think wit, I think wits is meant to be the replacement for um for wisdom. No, it's more a replacement for intelligence. Because uh, it has it, it talks about analysis and proficiencies. Yeah, which makes makes sense, and and then um, resol then resolve, which is which is your mental which is your mental fortitude. It's your charisma replacement. Yeah, and I'm perfectly I'm perfectly fine with having charisma re having charisma retitled in this regard because. Of how often charisma has been, has had the reputation of being the dump stat. Well, yeah, especially looking at this uh this nice uh nice little bit of resolve, willpower. When you run out of hit points, you must survive on sheer willpower alone. Your resolve modifier allows you to continue to fight in tense situations, even when you run out of hit points. Make your joke about the Black Knight here. <laughs> Or... Tis but a flesh wound. You are indeed brave tonight, but the fight is mine. Or if, or if you prefer going full weeb, um, 
Asuka, ver Asuka versus um, Zeruniel. <laughs> so then we go into ability checks, which work exactly the same. I do, I do like the fact that it, that they mentioned one ability check cannot do everything. That it is important that there are things ability checks cannot do, such as uh, looking at an intuition check. An intuition check cannot connect multiple subtle clues at a crime scene into a single logical conclusion, which is how you know that intuition is not the intelligence stat. Mm -hmm. An intuition check, a check cannot track a creature over miles and miles of forested area. An intuition check cannot calculate the necessary materials in time for a specific magic ritual. And an intuition check cannot study a ritual for an extended period of time. It also determines how well you can delight an audience with music, dance, acting, storytelling, or some other form of entertainment. Interesting. Uh, and I, th I think I think the I think the I think the reason it's important to list to list this kind of thing is it's not it's not about it's not about saying oh you can't you can't use that ability check to do something, but more of establishing the ground rules about what each ability score can do and what it can't do. Now, difficulty class is not um is not is not um not something that needs to be delved into too much. Um what I do And the same the same thing goes with it with um with advantage and disadvantage. It basically works the same the same way as normal. Then we go into the whole thing about what checks you can what checks can can't be done with each. Um and the whole thing with competitive checks working together, which is basically your um gr your group check. He even mentions group checks mm -hmm. directly. Yep. Um uh, and let's and profit and proficiency, which is has an interest, which has an interesting. It's wor the way it's worded. I find a bit interesting. Um, it says when a group, see for example, when a group sees a large archaic tomb and tries to recall the history of the symbol stitched onto the cover, unless the character has studied history, they will have no way, they would have no way to succeed, let alone attempt the check. In these instances, the GM should call for a proficiency check, allowing all players who have a specific proficiency to attempt the check, keeping in mind that an attempt to remember something is a resolve-based task. Um, I l I'm perfectly fine with that because you end up dodging the issue of, okay, who has what skill? Yeah, it makes it le less likely that there's actually going to be a skill monkey somewhere in your uh, in your group, which um, is cer is certainly appreciated given the numerous times that you that you've had it where where the uh, where whenever something skill related comes up, the rogue has to do all the work. Yep, we know our favorite skill monkey. Mm -hmm. And I know the argument is that is that in doing so he's provi he's providing a niche to contribute. That's not th the issue. Is um, that 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 the skill monkey ends up running into the same problem that say hacking has in a lot of cyberpunk games. You got one person doing the bulk of the work and the bulk of the die rolling, while everybody else is just sitting on their hands. Yep. And you want the entire the entire player base engaged. You don't just want one person hogging the spotlight. Mm-hmm. See, then it goes into profi proficiency, and then the proficiency, uh, bo then proficiency bonus. Um, let's see, and that then we ha then proficiency we have bonus. Uh, it can be affected by ancestry. Mm -hmm. That's one thing we should probably note. Yeah. Um. Let's see, and you you also gain proficiency in a number of skills, artistries, and weapon subtypes equal to your wits modifier. You do not lose proficiencies if you have a negative. 
and you can only gain simple proficiency in a weapon subtype in this way. So we're do, we're do so we're actually pay we're actually paying proper attention to um to equipment proficiencies. Very nice. Remember when equipment proficiencies actually meant something? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to skills, there's not a lot not a whole lot of things that um that changed, but there's there's one thing that someone highlighted that I that someone highlighted in the document that I wanted to point out. So it says, when a GM calls for an ability check, they may, they might determine that proficiency with a certain skill would aid the example in the situation. For example, if the Herald is trying to persuade a shopkeep to lower their prices by appealing to their emotions, the GM might call for an intuition check, saying the player could also add in their proficiency with the persuasion skill if they had it. This does not mean that the persuasion skill is tied to the intuition ability score. Yeah, because persuasion sounds more like it's probably a uh, a wits or resolve um, score. To... Mm -hmm. It's just that it's being used to enhance an intuition check. What I find interesting about this kind of this kind of setup is that it's divor is it seems to be an attempt to divorce the the strict one skill one one ability relationship that's been in these kind of systems and been a yeah. bad habit of designers for years. Yeah, where where that skill is only ever tied to one ability score and can't ever be associated with another. Mm -hmm. I like this because while you still get a bonus to that skill from the mod of whatever ability score is it is associated with, that doesn't mean that it can't be used to other abilities. Yeah. And when it comes, and then we have the whole thing with um, expertise, which is. And what I find interesting is instead of doing the whole, you're either proficient, you're either non, you either don't have a proficiency, you have a proficiency, or you have expertise. Instead, instead they're going with a tier system. And expertise from multi from that stacks is added together to create tiers of of expertise. It's basically just plus two, and then then addition, then an additional one for e for each one that stacks. Let's see. The skills we have are Arcana, Athletics, History, Nature, Investigation, Persuasion, and Skullduggery. I always love that sound. I always love the, the sound of that word. Oh. Skullduggery is all of your uh, trickery. Yeah. All of the, um, r all of the, um, thiefish fuckery. <laughs> they, uh, the examples they give are a check to determine whether you can lift a coin purse off another person, slip something out of another person's pocket, or tie someone up with a rope. Or, if you're going to conceal yourself from enemies, slink past guards, slip away without being noticed, or sneak up on someone without being seen or heard. So yeah, all your sneaky trickery. I wonder if a rogue could use this to do the exploding pants gag from Fallout. I'd allow it. <laughs> I'd allow it because I've done it. Eh, GM Fiat is a uh, wonderful, wonderful thing. Remember what he said at the top of the document. The most important thing is to have fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, artistries seems to seems to be seems to be the a um seems to be the a um rebranding of of a lot of the. A lot of the a lot of the profic the non weapon proficiencies from before that Go ahead. that and some of the non combat related skills mm -hmm. like animal handling yeah and it, let's see it's adventurers are also able to visit NPC artisans and utilize their services at twice the materials it would normally take to complete the task and relying on NPC artisans can be inconsistent. Can be inconsistent since it's unlikely to have a master craftsman for the bi for the bigger stuff. Um, but the artistries available are alchemy. No, not that one. 
I'm sorry. Whenever, whenever, al whenever alchemy is brought up, I al I always have an urge to say not that one because, uh, because of the amount of FMA fans that fo that follow us, and have been why, at my why table. You, why? Why do you think? <laughs> um, an animal handling, culinary arts. No, you are not. You are not going to cook something so good that their clothes fly off. Stop asking. Not unless you crit. Oh. However, you could make, remake an episode and or chapter of Dungeon Meshi. See that I'm that I'm willing to allow. Um, <laughs> but I but I draw the line at I draw the line at the food gasms from Food Wars. I only allowed that once, and I demanded that he that he go into explicit detail of the of the whole experience in front of the table. Which made everyone else very comfortable, very uncomfortable, and that was by design. Because I can be a petty motherfucker. That's almost as bad as the time I uh, allowed someone to try and pull off the uh, uh, Sen E Soshitsu move from Kill a Kill. I'm like, so you're going to strip them of the will to fight? How? Come on to details. It made the player uncomfortable to describe it. Well, he wanted to do it, so I don't see what the problem is. But, and, but anyway, um, then there's forging slash smithing. Um, the rit and the ritual arts, which is which is, are basically artistries that are that are tied to magic. Oh. I'd like to note that evocation is not what it usually is. Yeah, usually, usually evocation is it's fireball. And it, if I do a Rorschach test with the magical schools, and I bring up evocation, people are immediately going to say fireball. <laughs> the blaster wizards. Yeah. Nope. In this, uh, in this, in this case, evocation is a form of that alchemy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um. <sighs> but it's it's not even the it's not even the same spheres as as usual. Instead, there's some there's some familiar ones and some less familiar ones. We have abjuration, which is about what which is about what you'd expect. Divination, same. Evocation, um, man, soul manipulation, <laughs> um, imbuement. Evokes. <laughs> Which it which I'd say I say is equivalent to enchantment. Enchantment. Um, malediction. I which is... I love that. I love that they called their their witch doctor voodoo curse magic malediction. Um, all I have to say to that is, charm person dating service, hold person wedding chapel, remove curse divorce attorney. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Rest. Let's see. Restoration. I'm glad. I'm glad that. Uh, I'm glad that the healing spells are are given their own category. It's literally what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, my favorite word in this entire list, even more than malediction, transiteration. For moving things, this is where dimension door would be. Dimmy door or um, plane shift or uh, weather control, even apparently <laughs> controlling the movements of the weather because you're moving the weather. But uh, the, the reason I love this is because transiteration is a word that does not get enough love in, mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just re just remember just remember to just remember to um make when you when you do your teleporting make sure that you're operating uh, make sure that you are not operating under um spaceballs rules remember children uh teleportation instigiving is a serious risk and make sh make sure th make sure that the other that wherever you're teleporting into is um oh is clean. 
aka don't teleport into walls people i wasn't even going with, <laughs> i wasn't even going with that i was going i was going with the fly <laughs> and of course bringing up space balls because the teleportation system in that was um ass backwards literally yep <sighs> But then we then we have um the we have the fact that bonus proficien you get bonus proficiencies based on wits, basically one basically one for each modifier, and that's in addition to what they get from class ancestry or some or something else. Let's see then um, we, go ahead. You, you you get uh one for plus one and then two for both plus two and plus three right, and then three bad. four five or four mm -hmm. five six. Um, I'm perf I'm perfectly fine with that. Then we have, we of course have defenses or ability defenses, and skill proficiencies and defenses are in, are investigated as well. Oh, why why doesn't that why does that sound familiar to us? I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> it's not. Let's see. <laughs> Oh, then we ha then we have the whole thing with interacting with the wor with the world, the whole thing with time. <laughs> I I love they put this will take a while to type out fully. So here's a basic layout of how time is tracked. Everything's broken down. Everything is broken into units of six. Rounds are ten seconds long, so you can have six rounds for a minute. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a pretty long round. The rounds have been five to six seconds uh, in the other game. Yep. Let's see, then we then we have in, then we have of course and of course um, initiative, and I find I find this I find this particular thing interesting. Instead of everybody rolling initiative, you have a leader system. It says to, de to determine initiative, players choose a leader for the encounter. The leader and the leader only. Rolls a d20 and adds each party member's initiative bonus to the roll, along with any other appropriate modifiers. If the total exceeds the initiative score assigned to the encounter, the leader chooses one t one from one from their party to take their turn first. Otherwise, the GM chooses an actor from the encounter to take their turn first. The opposing and then go ahead. I was going to say, and then this alternates, just like when you're picking teams for dodgeball. Yes, and and just re just remember, folks, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Unfortunately, you can't dodge RN Jesus. He will fuck your dice up. No, no, you can you cannot dodge him. <laughs> but of course, of course, listen. I'm just waiting to see how long it's going how long it's going to take for before Piccolo gets a sponsorship from Dodge. I'm sure that's a question that he'll never ask because he probably doesn't give a shit about cars after what him and Goku went through. <laughs> <clears throat> oh. Then we have instances of, about when to use initiative and when to not use initiative. And what I do, what I do like is that is that the is that one of the exam one of the examples is not a fight; it's traps. And I like the fact that on um, when not to use initiative, there's two things that that people constantly use initiative on: um, ambushes and, in some cases, combat. Especially since some. Um, the fact of the the fact of the matter is. After the first round, initiative doesn't initiative in the traditional sense doesn't matter as much. Like once the once the cycle really gets started, it do, it it does it's it doesn't matter as much if you if you go for if you're at the top of initiative or not. I like the example for combat. I'm I'm just gonna read it out here. Mm -hmm. Some would think that initiative is necessary for all combat, and this is simply not the case. When the PCs are fighting an endless horde of zombies, and only need to survive long enough for
for the bell of Kurak Dur to be rung. Initiative is unnecessary. No matter how many zombies the PCs kill in this situation, there will always be more to take their place. The sequence of the zombies' turns do not matter. The PC will act as they will, hopefully together, and the zombies will react, probably poorly, to that action. This scene is already sequenced. Players act, zombies react. Which is why initiative, a tool for sequencing events, is not necessary. I like that. I really, really like that. So you guys are... This is a holding action. You just gotta hold out for a certain number of rounds. Okay. Do we roll initiative? No. Why? You go, then they go. So choose your, choose your actions. That is just so good. I like that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> the ambush one actually makes a lot of sense, because uh, if you sneak up and everybody's unaware of you, and then you kill everybody with a sneak attack before they can really react... Well, do you really need to roll initiative since there's nobody left to react? We like to call this the Eversore maneuver. <laughs> Evers <laughs> Eversore are still sne are technically sneaky. It's just it's just that they're only sneaky because everybody's dead. Yep. And um, that's the that's the tame version because we do not want to go into details about what happens to the to the victims of an of an Eversore assassination job. Let's just say the last person who had to watch the feed of that um, is, cur is currently in the puppy room. I still don't think that Holy Terra would have a puppy room. No, no, it would no, no, it would just have drugs. Yeah, they'd take stims while they were on the job. Beyond the uh, initiative, we have a description of turns and rounds and the action economy, which has what you would normally expect from this type of D20 game. You got your free actions, your actions, your movements, and your reactions. Yeah, stand standard fare. Um, and then, of course, it, that's broken into the types of actions, which, again, very much... Uh, the same of what you would mostly expect. You've got attack, dash, disengage, recover, and help. Mm -hmm. There's a hide action that the developer has not uh, gone into in detail, but gave us a down and dirty version. And that's various things provide cover, and they have to be at least the same size as you to provide cover. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, okay, um, I, I can't crouch down behind a box. <clears throat> when you have something between you and the thing looking for you, it grant the cover grants you a bonus. Um, and it, effectively, this grants extra ranks of the hidden condition. Um, and then when you hide, you are making a contested skullduggery check against a creature's defense? Okay! I figured it'd be skullduggery against something like a like their wits check, but uh, okay, fine by me. Probably a wits defense, to be honest, since there are, there's the, the ability defenses are a thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what this means is, if the creature knows where you are, it still knows where you are, but will have additional penalties on trying to hit you. If it doesn't know where you are, it will have additional penalties on trying to find you. And that's the down and dirty he gave us on hide. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, interact is a catch-all. Yep. And then we then we have reactions. Um. And and move and then the rules of movement. And I do, I do li I do like that. Your that he actually he actually gave he actually gave no he actually gave numbers for. For for move for the movement ability relationship. Yep. <coughs> although Dex. although he put in a note saying, a note on this section from your beautifully from your beautiful and totally not sleep deprived dev. These numbers are new and thus wonky. 
they will need some play testing to see how they should line up better. We have um, de so people with high decks are going to be able to have have more have more um, well speed. Um, it's no longer tied to race at this point, mm -hmm. which is nice. And you know you no longer have the case of everybody moves thirty feet because um, that dwarf with the nag one decks because of his heavy armor now moves twenty. Which, Make one dex mod, I should say, and the and the per, and the the speed, <coughs> the high the high speed rogue can move more than thirty more than thirty feet, which which given the fact that he's supposed to be hiding and and sneaking to backstab, his focus once he's discovered his focus should be getting out of the way. Um, unlike hell, this is the this is a maneuver I like to call get the fuck out of dodge. Yep. Um. The only other game I can, the only other major game I can think of that, di um, that's using the D twenty framework that did give some attention to ability scores determining movement, is Heroes Against Darkness. Mm -hmm. Although that that one that one also also added that the, the half level modifier can apply to movement as well, so you could have some crazy ass movement at level twenty. I'm glad he has encumbrance rules, but just like we've discussed in the past, I think that encumbrance tends to just get kind of ignored. Um, to be uh, to be honest, the only time that it, the the last time that I used anything like encumbrance was when I was playing Torchbearer. Yeah, and this game doesn't seem like it's going to be like that. So. Yeah, if you're if you're do if you're tr if you're doing if you're trying to do the down and dirty down and dirty knaves like like old old school um and we're we're talking like white box level shit mm. then I can understand doing in doing encumbrance because you're not trying to be you're not trying to be the um the the future heroes or so, or something like that um but if you're do but if you're but if you are trying to do that kind of heroic fantasy, I think that abstract that a bit of abstraction when it comes to equipment and encumbrance is warranted. It's why it's why I don't get on it's why I don't get on um say feng shui for the lack of firearm detail. Although I although I will give them although I will give feng shui two credit for the fact that it actually has a rule it actually has a rule for the click clack. Of um, shotguns, <laughs> which makes sense because feng shui is all is all about rule of cool. Um, there are a lot of games like that. Let's see, then we have jump distance based on strength and swim speed based on constitution. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty interesting one. Which do, which does which as as so, as somebody who had who had who had a cup of coffee when it came to when it came to when it came to competitive swimming does make me laugh mhm mm oh so you then th we have things like breaking up your move moving between attacks using di using different using different speeds which you can sw which you can switch to by by establishing a core speed that that basically the one you can use the f the fastest. Um, I do have to wonder if somebody has a faster climb speed than they have a movement speed. Are they gonna are they gonna try um, aggressively spider walking and calling that climbing? I mean, you have to be moving between the two surfaces for you to establish a core speed. Mm -hmm. Um. So if if they're just going up to walls to spider climb across them, I don't think a DM is gonna allow that. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying doing spider walks across the across the floor and calling it climbing. Oh God, no, <laughs> no, no, that doesn't count. I'm I'm sorry. I can see a Munchkin saying that. I can definitely see a Munchkin trying to claim that, and I go, bruh, you're on the floor. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, then we have quick. Then we have quick actions, which I th I think it would be fair to say that qu that quick actions are going are going to be the the equivalent to bonus actions. 
Um, no. Uh, quick actions are the same things as they are in, uh, uh, I guess, the, the type of action you can do during your move step. Yeah. You know, drawing or storing a weapon. So... F open... Yeah, I, I can... All right. In that, in that case, I'll put that up as my bad. Um, then we have encumbrance, which is strength score plus con plus con mod. Um, with with size, with um, with it be with it being doubled for each for each size category above um, medium. And halved if you're tiny. So um. I can think I can think of a few shorter friends of ours who would probably have to have their um, encumbrance. I can think of one guy I was teasing earlier today. <laughs> uh. And then we have a very dissected section on how you make an attack roll. Yeah. And. For for the for the most part, it is ab it is about what it is about what you would ex expect, except for a couple things. One, um, the ability modifier is either strength or dexterity, whichever is higher, regardless of the weapon. Spell and skill attacks also require an attack roll. Thank you. And then and then I think the biggest change. Um, your critical hits and your critical fumbles still exist, people. Mm -hmm. But, uh, regardless of those, if you roll a 1 through a 4 on your d20, no matter what other modifiers or the defense of your target, you miss. Period. End of story. On the flip side, if you roll a 17 through 20, no matter the modifiers or defense of the target you're, you're targeting, you hit. Period. End of story. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more fair. It's going to be a little more consistent. That's that's nice. I like consistency. We appreciate consistency in this humble temple. <laughs> um, it's also going to make for those times when you do get your critical fumbles or critical hits uh, even more exciting. Because oh yeah, you knew you you, you, you knew you were going to roll high enough to hit the dude, sure. But you got that critical that you really really needed. That also that also means that you have a one in, fi in instead of instead of a five percent chance of critting or botching, you have a you have you have a twenty percent chance. Well, a you have a, tw a, a you have a twenty percent chance of just failure or success. Your crit your crit or fumble is still a one in twenty. Mm -hmm. But in in terms of that whole autom in terms of that whole automatic thing, um, I'd say I'd say doing that kind of thing um, puts puts a sig puts a significant amount more risk reward in these kind of, in these kind of things because yeah you've got a one in five chance of automatically hitting but you've got a one in five chance of automatically missing. Yeah, and I think uh, one one in four. It's mm -hmm. one through four or seventeen through twenty. One yeah. in four chance of, of hitting or, or missing. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think that the best uh, the best and and also one of the parts that's going to make people cringe is well I've got like all these mods that put me at twenty six. Doesn't matter. You roll a four. <laughs> four is auto auto miss, bro. Sorry. Alternatively. Let's say you somehow get into an encounter that is way too high level for your little party, and so you know the AC of whatever you're swinging at is uh, too high for you to do any hitting. But you roll that 17. Oh, you did hit. There you go. Well, how much damage did you do? A little bit, but hey, every little bit it helps in those encounters where you're way in over your head. And let's see, then we we have the usual affair when it comes to melee attack and and improv and improvised weapons, um, and we have the whole thing. We have ranged attacks, which do, not a whole lot change. Not a whole lot changes on that front. Um, then, okay, here's here's something I find I find interesting, and this was some. And truth be told, 
What I'm about to get to next was something that was dipped into in um in D in the D and D next playtest, but it was but it was never explored and it was eventually dropped, and that is um and that is that is a, that is treating treating spells themselves like like a standard attack roll. Um. And it's it said eventually, eventually he'll have a little picture with the numbers by each of the things to make this more athetic, aesthetically pleasing. For now, he's got this. I don't know. I don't. I don't mind that. I don't mind this. There's a bit of the, there's a bit of breakage, but that's going to happen with a document. But it's basically it's, this is basically a a tease of how spells are going to be listed in the in the spell appendix. So you have fi you have fire spell focus fire blast one d six plus class ability modifier fire damage ignite three of three afflicted fire target singular range thirty feet defense dexterity secondary effect options thirty plus thirty foot to range um one changes target to area fifteen feet sphere two plus ten additional feet to the area. And another one of of uh, weapon focus, and that and that is flame weapon. The focus thing I think I think will be interesting to go over when we get to the actual spell system. Um. Yeah, I, I, that seems like it's going to be fun to dive into. Let's see. It says to cast a spell, you must choose an item you are wielding to shape the spell. The most common items to which aid casters in the shaping of the spell are spell foci and weapons listed above. Some features allow characters to channel spells through other items or means, but the spell still works in the same way. The item through which your channel determines which defense the attack targets, the target of the spell, and the range at which the spell can be utilized. It also determines the primary effect of your spell. As shown above, channeling the fire spell through a spell focus gets it a singular target, a range of 30 feet, an attack which targets dexterity, and two possible primary effects. Unless you have a feature which says otherwise, channeling a spell through your bare hands counts as channeling the spell through the unarmed weapon. Um, which it, I'm glad. I'm actually glad that they that they uh, specified that. Which means, it still means you can do your hadokens. Yeah. Um. It also it also mean it also means that that your that that um. That your focus, or should I say, your catalyst, is important, and wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does this, does this make way of four elements monk useful? <laughs> Possibly, we'll get to that. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. It, it. If if it's through their unarmed weapon, and they've got like a focus and proficiency with unarmed weapons, all of a sudden casting spells through your hands is the shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there is there is that possibility. I'm not sh I'm not sure if I'm not sure if we're gonna have a XP of Way of Four Elements, but um, it's certainly something to consider. Um, anyway, even even if you don't, just take a level and sort can do it anyway. Burning hands for days. <laughs> Flurry of burning hands, anyone? <laughs> Unless you have a feature which says otherwise, channeling a spell through your... Through, I already mentioned that. Finally, various features will allow a character to channel secondary effects into a spell. Unless a character has a feature which grants them access to the spell's secondary effects, like spell points, they may not channel them into the spell. Like primary effects, certain secondary can only be chosen, chosen when the spell is channeled through a specific item. Most spells, like the fire spell above, have a list of universal secondary effects which can be channeled into the spell regardless of item. A secondary option can be chosen multiple times as long as there is a feature that grants a character access to secondary options, allows for multiple ones to be chosen. Um, so basically, you can choose a secondary option multiple times if you have a feat that says you can. This also, because, because of the way that those two spells were written, there's also the implication that metamagic is included in spells out of the box. Yeah. Yeah, it does. If you have spell points, you can do stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, looking at the, uh, 
the fi the fire spell focus. Um, the secondary effect options that are ones that would you would specifically need to channel them through a thing or to use spell points. Mm -hmm. Plus 30 feet to range. And then uh, changing target to an area of a 15 foot spear or and then adding additional 10 additional feet to the area of that sphere. Yeah. But then we have the universal secondary effect options for anything that has to do with fire magic. Uh, plus 1d6 fire damage, plus 2 more afflicted with fire, and then of course uh, changing the target area to a 15 foot cone, and then adding 10 additional feet to the cone. <laughs> what is this, the Aeon gun? If you, uh, for if, the... if you want. Uh, <laughs> let's just add enough secondary effect options to make the cone infinite. Then it really is the Edeon gun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ridiculous. I love it. <sighs> and let's see that. Then we have weapon attacks, spell attacks, and skill attacks, which is which is something that's gone over. Then and the whole thing with damage rolls. And, well, here's something I find interesting. When you miss with a weapon attack, you deal half of the amount of damage as you would have dealt had you hit with the attack. But no extra damage. From, but the attack does not do any de extra damage from spells that would affect its damage, nor does it activate any features that require you to hit. So it's still throwing you a bone, even if you whiff. It's... It's, uh, it's Swarm. All over again. It's the Swarm tag. Mm -hmm. The one that we have over on FF Legend. Um, what this That it does ha half damage and then doesn't, uh, and, and doesn't do any procking, but that's it. This also, re this also reminds me of the, of the, de of the damage minimum rule in Stars Without Number and Worlds Without Number. Yes. Where may... Melee attacks will always melee attacks will always do a minimum amount of damage even if they miss. Ranged attacks will not. Okay, hold on. Generally, when you miss with a spell attack, the attacks of the spell are not actualized and you do not deal any of the spell's damage, but you do not consume any resources for casting the spell. Holy shit. While there is risk reward using a spell attack, you know, Risk is mitigated by the fact that, oh, I went to try and cast the spell and nothing happened, so I still have all the pieces for the spell. I could try again later. No more spell wasting! <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that... Well, I can't assume it anymore. We don't even know if this is using Vancian model, or at least I don't yet. We'll, we'll, hold, off on, we'll hold off on that for later. Yeah, but... It, it, even if it is using Vancian model, that's huge. If it doesn't consume any resources, that includes spell slots. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let's see. And when you miss with an attack, you generate one point towards your combat focus. When, when you, when you've, when a character has generated enough points. Towards their combat focus, determined by their background, they can erase all combat focus points and make their next attack with adva with advantage. I like this because even when you, even if you suck, you're still you're still getting something out of it. One, you're still <laughs> doing half damage. Two, you're you're um if you keep if you keep sucking, eventually the dice gods are going to force you to to suck less. Although you could still miss even on the one flip advantage. It would be a, it would be ridiculously hard to. I mean, unless you roll a four and a three. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yep. <laughs> there is that possibility. Yeah. Then they go into threat range and critical hits, which works about the same about the same as as you as usual, and or rather, it works in the way that I pre that I'd prefer it, that I would prefer it to. Um, Starts with a single number, and then that threat range can be expanded yep. by features. Um, but when it comes to critical hits, um, critical hits, you ro you roll 
you don't double your total damage, you double the damage dice. Then add yes. any modifiers as normal. Yes. Um, let's see, when you roll within your threat on a spell attack, you can choose additional secondary modifiers for that spell equal to the number of secondary effects you originally channeled. This does not expend additional resources or count against the normal amount of secondary effects you could normally channel. So, so basically, if you crit with your spell, you get all the meta magic. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, if you're doing this with a spell attack that's channeled through a weapon, you've got to choose to either get spell surge or or have the weapon crit. You can't do both. Which well, is... I, I imagine that if you're casting the spell through the weapon, you're probably going to go with the spell. You think probably you're probably crit fishing. Yeah, you're probably if, if if well, I mean, not even if you're crit fishing, you're you're probably doing this so that whatever spell, like you want to hit them. You, I, I think that this would be more a, a cons another consistency. You're you're channeling the spell through the weapon because even if you miss with the spell and weapon on that roll, the weapon does half of its own damage. No harm, no foul. You've still contributed mm -hmm. if the weapon hits the spell goes off too mm -hmm. so you get that spell and then if you spell surge or maybe you weren't planning for a spell surge but you still put some meta magic into this channeled weapon or this channeled spell maybe it was a a, a secondary effect that uh turns it into the cone let's say that's what that's one of the things all right you want to increase the cone's range then you want your cone to go further so you do Mm -hmm. You get to, since you channeled one secondary effect, you now get to channel another one since that's what the rules say about a spell surge. And now you've got a 25 foot cone of fire instead of a 15 foot cone. Boom! <laughs> Burning hands again! <laughs> I like this. This is such a, this is an interesting take on attacks. Yeah. Um, I want. Now, when it comes to two-weapon fighting, I find th I find this particularly interesting. Now, I've talked about I've talked about how much how how much I've hate how much I've hated certain attempts at two-weapon fighting, especially since a lot of times, in order to try and balance it with people who don't have two weapons, there's a, there's always attempts to gimp it or pay to not suck. There's no payment here. No, in this case, and it doesn't and it doesn't suck. Yeah. If what the fuck? If you're armed with a light melee weapon in each hand, shields are excluded from this category. Then you, then once per turn, when e you miss even if the character has the fighting style of shieldsman or shield maiden, mm -hmm. which I assume is a uh, is a fighting style that lets you fight with shields, a la Captain America. Yeah. Um, once per turn, when you miss with a melee weapon attack or a thrown weapon attack while dual wielding, I like the thrown part. You may make one additional melee weapon attack or thrown weapon attack as a free action with the weapon you're wielding in your other hand. You may use your unarmed strike if you are proficient in unarmed strikes and still have a free hand as one of as one of the weapons. This basically means that two weapon fighting is a way to turn a miss into more damage because if you miss with the first melee weapon attack or the first thrown weapon attack because they're weapon attacks, they still do half damage. Mm -hmm. And then you still get to make another fucking attack. And this isn't even using the extra attack feature. This is... this is You're not paying for anything. It's not a gimped roll in any way. And it, 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 it... Sure, it only occurs on a miss, but it gives you a chance to do damage into half. Because the miss does half damage, and then the additional attack does normal damage. Mm -hmm. This is... What the fuck? See, then... Then we have, um... Well, then we have something fun when it comes to grappling. Remember the long-ass grappling rules in 3rd edition? Don't... Don't remind me. Please stop. <laughs> um... Not like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, gr so, grappling is a special melee attack using the attack action. If you have proficiency in unarmed strikes, you can add that proficiency to the roll, obviously. If you're able to make multiple attacks with the attack action, this replaces one of them. The target can be can can be no more than one size larger than you and must be within reach. Okay. 
obvious. Obvious. Have to have a free hand. Mm -hmm. And your and your attack targets a different ability defense depending on how you make your attack. If you add if you add strength to the to the attack, you target their strength defense. If you add dex to the attack, you target their dex defense. I most of the t a lot of times when grapple the when grapple has been used, it's treated as a contested strength check. I like this because well, even luchadors still grapple. Which means even dex builds might might still might still want to might still want to wrestle, including monks. If you do not have at least simple proficiency in unarmed strikes, you treat this attack as an improvised attack. Otherwise, you make the attack roll as normal. Mm -hmm. If you see if you succeed, you subject the target to a severity of the hindered condition equal to the ability modifier with which you made the attack. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What is the hindered? I'm I'm gonna skip ahead just to find that real quick. Real quick. Hindered condition. Where are you? You said hidden marked. Okay, hindered. Each of a creature's movement types are reduced by five feet for each severity of the hindered condition afflicting it. If a creature is rendered unable to move with its movement while afflicted by the hindered condition, weapon attack rolls against the creature have advantage, and creature's weapon attack rolls have disadvantage. And attacks which target the creature's dexterity defense have advantage. You can... You full Nelson somebody and you make it so that they're hit real easy and if you're attack if you're attacking their dex defense, like with fire moves, they'd have advantage as well. What the fuck? And even if you don't inflict enough severity to bring them to zero, you're still like holding on to them and making it harder for them to move. Mm-hmm. And then there's this interesting asterisk here. The dash action interacts with the hindered condition in an interesting way. Dashing grants a creature additional movement rather than doubling a creature's movement speed. For example, if a creature has a normal movement speed of 20 feet and is afflicted by hindered 4, its weapon attack rolls would have disadvantage as the condition states. If, however, the creature dashes as its action, it would effectively gain 20 more feet of movement, and so the second part of the condition would not apply to it. If that same creature is afflicted by hindered 8, dashing would provide no bonus to it, since the bonus movement would not be able to overcome the condition. So because instead of dashing, uh, just doubling your movement speed for the, the duration of your movement, it literally adds on more movement speed. You could deliberately use dash to mess with grapple. What the fuck? <laughs> well, there, there. We have seen, we have seen, we have seen scenes in our fair share of stories where someone's attempt, someone's attempt to get choked out is to, is to reposition so that, so that the grappler is hitting the wall or something. Yeah, and um. <laughs> I keep I keep thinking of that of that one finish at Survi at Survivor Series. You know, take take a take a choke, flip around, and turn it and turn it into a pin. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, uh, congratulations! You made you you made grappling interesting. Um. You made grappling. I. I'm just. I uh, words, monk. I have none. <laughs> I don't know how to react to this. It makes me feel interested in a D twenty system for the first time in a long time. Let's see, and continuing on, then we have um, fight def fighting defensively, which allows you to recover yourself when the conditions against you seem dire. If you may choose to fight defensively at the beginning of your turn, and its effects last until the beginning of your next turn, 
When you fight defensively, all attacks that would target a physical ability defense target your highest physical ability defense rather than its normal target, and all attacks which would target a mental ability defense target your highest one rather than normal. To compensate, all of your attacks which would... would basic, basically, um, when fighting de when fighting defensively, it's all it's all about whatever your highest bonus is, whatever your highest um defenses are, but that applies both ways. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. You can but also it's it. it's still really good. It's really fun. Um, you can also remove harmful conditions from yourself, removing a number um, an amount of severity equal to your con mod from the conditions affecting you. So if you were aff afflicted 6 poison and stunned 1 and had a constitution modifier of 3, you could remove either 2 severity of the poison condition and 1 severity of the stun condition, or just put all 3 in poison. Honestly, if you're stunned, I'd rather get that stun out of there first. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded of the condition ladders from Wine, but this is, but this is significantly simpler. Um, let's see, then shove, disarm, um, l lunge, or you can use a quick you can use a quick action to increase the reach of an attack by five feet. And it doesn't move you from your current hex. So you so in order so in order to have some reach, you don't necessarily have to have to be do, have to be doing a spear build. You can give yourself reach using a lunge. Mm -hmm. It just has to happen uh, as a quick action. Yeah. And a, quick, a ten feet quick action. So it's not it's not going to be a un, it's not going to be a universal fix, but it is but it is something you can do to help to help, to help boost to help boost reach. I'm just imagining someone trying to. How how you'd visualize doing this with um, unarmed? <laughs> is it a fly? Lunge with a. Go ahead. I was gonna say uh, lunge either either uh, um, a a good old fashioned Goldberg spear, mm -hmm. or a flying kick, like you were about to say. Yeah. Let's see, health, injury, and recovery. Hit points work about work about the same about the same way. Um, the amount of hit points apparently is dependent on your ancestry and level. Inter interesting. So it seems it seems like he's having races slash ancestries have a significant amount uh, more amount more um, impact than they do normally. So normally Which... after you, after you get after you get a few levels into a campaign. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, but it's a. Uh, it doesn't feel shoehorned. That's the big thing. Mm -hmm. It feels very natural. Yeah. See, we are. Then there's the whole thing of sur of surviving, surviving at zero hit points. And when that when that happens, you make a mark against your willpower and then vitality. Willpower. When all of your hit points are expended, you must con you must con you must continue on willpower alone. Unlike hit points, willpower is measured in tallies. You are still conscious at zero hit points as long as you have willpower remaining. When whenever you end your turn with zero hit points or take damage from any source, will at zero hit points you make a mark against your willpower. When you have none, you fall unconscious. You regain one willpower each time you begin a turn with at least one hit point, including temp. And then there's vitality, which, duh, which um, it does it does feel like it does feel like in some in some ways vitality is gonna be is gonna be the answer to hit dice. Although with uh, although with none of the things that annoyed me about hit dice. And. Let's see. Then, for, then fortitude and focus, which are the, which are which are going to be the phys are going to be physical and mental and mental um. And and mental set mental um setups. Actually, no, I take that back. Fort 
For fortitude, that's determining how many hit points you get when you try and push forward. And whenever whenever you're pu pushing forward, you spend one VP and you gain hit points equal to twice your fortitude. Um, it also determines the threshold against certain conditions. Focus um, deter determines the number of mental conditions you can handle at any given time. And they we also have a return of massive damage in the form of savage attacks. Yeah. If damage from an attack would reduce you to zero hit points and exceeds your maximum exceeds half your maximum hit point total, you lose all willpower and immediately fall unconscious. It's the massive damage rule. Except this one it doesn't kill you. Mm-hmm. See, then we... There's a there's a different rule for that. Mm -hmm. See, then we have sta we have stabilize, which can be done as a quick action. Um, then we have instant de instant death, which is basically if you're at zero HP and you take your max HP in damage, mm -hmm. uh, you you die. And this counts as if you're above zero HP and you take enough uh, damage to take you to zero uh, and then take you. To negative your max HP. Yep. Which is, those are the old death rules, like really old death rules. Except they're just they've just been changed to instant death. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep. And then I think this this last rule is uh. This was one of the ones he was proud he was proud of when I when I talked. He about should it. be. The death flag. So uh. For all of you fucking weebs out there, remember not to say anything too untoward, or, or you'll plant this fucker right in the ground. Characters do not die when they fall unconscious. It is a normal part of the dangerous life that is adventuring. Instead, characters only die when the entire party falls unconscious. They are dealt enough damage to cause instant death, or when they raise the death flag. A character may raise the death flag at any time during their turn as a free action and do not need to be conscious in order to do so. When a character raises the death flag, they are granted specific benefits as described in their class description. After a character raises the death flag, they are on borrowed time, utilizing all of their effort in order to stay alive and, defending and defend their ally. After a character has raised the death flag, they die at the end of the encounter, though they have enough time to stabilize their party if the party is unconscious. There are no exceptions to this rule. Any character that raises the death flag dies at the end of the encounter in which they raised it and, when making a new character, must choose a different ancestry and a different class than their previous character. So, my example for everyone here, since this is the most weeby thing in the death area of the entire document thus far, is this. Gurren Lagan, Episode 8. The moment Kamina raises his death flag is after he's been hit by the uh, the lance, mm -hmm. and everybody's screaming for him, and he goes and gets uh, Shimon in order to teach him the Giga Drill Breaker. That is raising the death flag. Yeah. Um, would you also say? Would you also say um, Grease Blizzard is is a case of the death flag? Why would you say that right now? Why do we have to go back to one of the best people in in build dying to that? <sighs> yes. Yes, that's raising the death flag. Well, if if I brought if I brought up Kimishima, no none of the audience would get it. Only you would. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, that NPC death, not going to creature out. Dam damage types, um, which is a, which is about what I'd expect. Then we have damage reduction. Well, hold on, Go ahead. hold on. They 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 uh they have a different name for force damage. Yeah, and I like theric. it. A theoric, which makes a lot more sense. It also means I don't have to deal with Jedi jokes every time someone casts magic missile. I cast magic missile at the darkness. Dear God, that joke is so old. That joke is sold. When I first heard it, I fell off my dinosaur and broke my rock diapers. 
Mm, I figured you'd needed a reminder of how old you were. <laughs> yep. Um. Let's see. Dam and for damage, re damage reduction. Um. I do. I do like that there that even with damage reduction there is a cap. You you will always take at least two points of damage from whatever source you have DR against. Mm -hmm. That's uh that's nice. That means DR can't make you in fucking vincible. Yep. And then we have resistance and vulnerability. Um which, which seem to do basically what they say on the tin. Yeah. Have to ha um Half damage or d or double damage. Um, I would pr I would probably I would probably clarify if if this if if this is if if this is a if this is a they they special they specify the they specify the order of reduction. But it's it's but I think that I think that what should also be specified is that this applies to the final amount, not how many not how many die you roll. Yeah, it's it's. It's whatever. Uh, whatever your result is. Yeah. And. Of course, of course, resistance and vulnerability don't stack. Yeah. See, then um, dam um, damage damage threshold, which is Im immunity to damage unless it takes an, am an amount equal or greater to that threshold, in which case it takes it as normal. Reminds me of boss shields. Yeah, that's that's kind of, that's kind of what it's going for. See, then we have resting and pu and pushing forward. Um. Which I'm per which I'm perfectly f I'm perfectly fine with, and I like that it, I like that they pointed th that this was pointed out. The guidelines are not are not the only options either. GMs are encouraged to pick a time requirement for each rest, which matches the above assumption: three to four resource draining encounters between each rest. For example, a GM may run six to eight resource draining encounters in a day, and so would be expected to grant players a rest in the middle of the day and one in the evening. In order for the game to function as intended. Nice way to point it out. And then, of course, I, I like the uh, the fact that they point out that pushing forward only starts count uh, costing things uh, after uh, the first use. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and then we have we have um, resupplying. Which again, this goes this goes back to that whole abstracting of of item maintenance. Mm -hmm. When your party resupplies, they refill their inventory with things like potions, poisons, or maintenance kits. In order to resupply, you have to have access to a resupply cart, or have a feature which allows them to do so. Some classes, like rangers, are able to resupply without the use of a cart, through their ability to, to forage and procure resources naturally. I look forward to seeing how the rangers are going to be handled in this because, um, as I've discussed in the past, rangers have been the most have been one of the most snake bitten classes in recent years. Yep. Um. Let's see, then we have then we have resting. At the end of a rest, you get all of your HP and vitality back, um, as well as reduce your exhaustion level by an amount equal to your con mod, a min with a minimum of two, provided you've also ingested some food and drink. Um, then a extended rest, which seems to be a work in progress. If a character has earned enough experience to advance to their next level, they must complete an extended rest in order to gain the effects of that level. Work in progress, developing later. Don't worry about it for now. This uh, this sounds like he's now starting to pull from a more modern uh, Elder Scrolls series. Mm -hmm. You so, gotta sleep to get your level up. Yeah. Um, and we have... Um, I could also be a smartass and bring up Final Fantasy XV as well. Hmm. <laughs>
Mm, uh-huh. Where you have to sleep to tally your XP. Mm-hmm. Although, per- although personally, I personally I just do it anyway, just so I, just so I can see just so I can see what kind of cooking Ignis is gonna render. I want an Ignis cookbook, damn it. They haven't made an FF15 cookbook, but the FF14 cookbook just went on pre-order. Yeah, which is which is understandable. But ser- but seriously, all the recipes that he ends up making and how ha- and how and how well they replicated th- them in po- and Polly, I want. Is it wrong of is it so wrong of me that I that I want that I want to be able to try and replicate some of those recipes myself? No, no, it's not unfair to want to do that. Um, let's see then conditions and wounds. We have universe. We have um, universal conditions, and a lot of these are what we are the kind of conditions what we of what we'd expect. Um, and then we have severity ones, which are which are going to be the ones that are me- that that are measured in well severity. I do I I do like this little quick note that he put in. Your total buffs can't exceed your fortitude if they are a physical or focus if they're mental. So you can only be buffed to the in the to the maximum severity of either your fortitude or your or your focus. Now, your, your total buffs, so the total severity of all the buffs that you have, can't exceed fortitude. Yeah, well, no. Your total buffs can't exceed your fortitude if they are physical. Mm-hmm. So all of your physical buffs, their severities, have to add up to your fortitude or less. The same goes for mental buffs. They have to All, all the severities have to add up to your focus or less. That's so, what I'm taking from this. So, so we, so we're not going to have that situation that always happens just before the, just before the, um, the, bo- the boss of the instance, for instance, where everybody stacks so many buffs on themselves they might as well not be fighting fair. Yeah. And to and to be fair, I'm not I'm not disparaging that tactic because it's very much a case of don't hate the player, hate the game. And most MMOs are going to encourage that kind of thinking, and most RPGs are going to encourage that thinking. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'd like to note here that each of these uh, um, conditions is paired, uh, the negative condition with its positive uh, uh, counter effect. Mm-hmm. So you could, pro- you could probably have it that they cancel each other out. Um, probably if you get in- afflicted with one and then afflicted with the other and they're the same severity, you've just dr- dropped both. In fact, in fact, that seems to be the case because look, because for example, with marked and hidden, it says a, a creature cannot be both marked and hidden. If the two conditions would affect the same creature, the lower severity is subtracted from the higher. Yep, and then if and then of course, if both are the same severity, they're one is subtracted from the other. You get zero. Zero severity means there's no condition anymore. Mm-hmm. So that yep, that makes sense. And let's see. Then we have the whole we have the whole thing with wounds. So features that are able to wound or disease a creature will always be explicitly marked when they are wounded. The condition applied to it is not bound by duration. They are sen- essentially a negative condition that does not expire normally. Some conditions, like confusion, remove severity naturally. A wound disease that or a disease that causes confusion would not remove any severity of the condition, even if the condition procked. Um, wounds may be healed through seeking aid within town, costing time rather than currency. When one seeks treatment for their wounds in town, they may either remove a severity of physical wounds from the equal to their fortitude score, or mental wounds equal to their focus score. They can also pay p- currency to remove additional wounds during their next treatment. Let's see. And then the currency rarity determines extra severity of wounds treated. Oh. I love that the currency rarity is not, you know, the normal currency block, but it's just separated into mundane, common, uncommon, rare, very rare, and legendary. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Then we have the whole thing with um, fa- with falling damage, which inflicts wounds instead of dealing damage to hit points. And your dex gives you a safe falling distance. Um. The idea that somebody who has 20 decks being able to safely drop 35 feet 
as somebody who's had his own experience with with falling um is terrifying i mean 20 decks is basically a professional acrobat who might as well be a trapeze artist or or a grease man that too See, and then wound severity based on fall height is based on the multiplier of your safe falling distance. Where where um f where five times above it is instant death. Instant death. <laughs> so So if you're if you're if you're at twenty decks, your safe falling distance is thirty five feet. However, if you fall one hundred seventy five feet, you die. No superhero landing for you. Unless, of course, you, you know, have feather fall or something. In which case, that's not a superhero landing. That's just a, that's just a Adam Jensen landing. <laughs> the Icarus. That thing was so useful. Mm -hmm. Oh. Let's see, then a few unlisted conditions. Because, um, for, for the ones that aren't, for the ones that aren't discussed, like, um, Frightened, because for, and I do I do like this that um it it they, that fear or frightened don't have their own mechanics but would instead rely on the mechanics of other conditions. I'm fine with that because it gives more options for the for that kind of thing. Um, and of co of course of course the same thing goes with sleep deprivation and exhaustion. Oh. I like um I like that sleep deprivation. Uh, you gain three severity of a condition of the GM's choice, mm -hmm. which most closely matches your exhaustion. Yep. And it's a wound that can only be cured by resting. And even if you're of an ancestry that doesn't sleep, such as elves, uh, the same rules apply if you resist going into your meditative trances. Mm -hmm. Um. Then there's the whole thing with features, which there's not a whole lot to dissect with that part of it. Especially since it's kind especially since at the time of this recording it's a little bit unfinished. And the same thing goes with environment. Not a whole lot to re I'd say not a whole lot to really um to really go to really go over. Um Well his, I love I love I love at the end for the encounter stuff. Uh, he has dev notes about ignoring it because he's probably going to move it over to the encounter area anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the whole the whole thing, Espe yeah, especially the whole in underwater encounters. Um, and we have wealth, favor, experience, and re and reputation. Um, we actually have full on full on wealth levels, which um or or in this case tiers. And the appropriate character levels for each of them, as well as as well as um, item rarity. I'm perfectly fine with that. Gives a bit of gives a bit of scaling, so that you so that you don't feel like you're you're a glorified hobo when you're at level twenty. Um. Let's see, then fi then we have favor, which can be awarded to a player for making the game fun. And yeah, this is a meta game mechanic. Yeah, it's. I was gonna. I was gonna say that it is um, no, it, it it's not too far removed from inspiration, but it but instead of just rolling with advantage, you roll a d6 and add it to the total. Yeah, it, it does point out specifically that favor should not be a reward for role playing, but is specifically about players making the game better for other players. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and then. And um, experience. Um, one th one thing that I can't help but note is that is that um the ex the experience um, the experience gained and the experience thresholds are significantly smaller. Yeah, it's probably to avoid the stupid fucking uh, number bloat that you would see in D and D. I'd say it's. Wait what we what we kind of have here is a is a bit of a um pyramid setup when it comes to the experience threshold yeah i can see that um, but there's there 
but there's also the fact that the whole the whole the whole, I'd say I'd say one of the things that's really being avoided in and, and truth be told is something that I personally avoid in a lot of my games is figuring out how much experience you get for killing certain monsters. The only time the only time that I've ever utilized that is in the la in the last few years is fantasy craft and that's because XP budgets are built into monster creation. I stopped using XP a long time ago. I'm guessing you just uh, did it as um as story threshold leveling. Uh story threshold or um particular so I never went in to a game with the mentality that I see a lot of DMs have of trying to keep bar a party's average level consistent throughout all party members. Uh, I rewarded good role playing. I rewarded uh, ingenious ideas. I rewarded, you know, all the things to try and get my players to engage. Um, <clears throat> sometimes this caused a really outstanding player to be one or two levels ahead of the rest of the party. But that was never a hindrance. Um, and so I would use not only story thresholds to give everybody a level, but sometimes if a plan was absolutely brilliant or absolutely batshit but still worked, <laughs> um, the guy who came up with it would get a level up because it was that good. To me, it was always an achievement-based thing. Some sort of achievement, some sort of... Uh, some sort of, uh, of accomplishment, either specific to a person or, or uh, collectively amongst the whole party. Mm -hmm. I like the small amount of XP here, though. This reminds me a little bit more of World of Darkness. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that. Um, and we have the we have the whole thing with reputation and alignment. Um, I like how it's in quotes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and not, and that's on a tier system, which again is very reminiscent of um, world of of world of darkness, where the t where the tier can the tier can be applied both ways. And at first, it's a common reputation. It's there, but sits in the back of the minds, which is which advantage or disadvantage. And every tier above that, you add a, you add an additional d you add additional d six, positively or negatively. Uh huh. Oh. Um, and it's and since. It, this this doesn't feel this doesn't feel like traditional alignment this feels far this feels far more in line with um with the icon system from 13th age it's not doing exactly the same thing but it's in that same regard of the of the the of relationships being up to interpretation And well, well, let, well. Let's be let's be honest. We um, we are no fans of alignment here in the temple, at least in the traditional sense. Well, and, and definitely in the sense that they are just way too strict when people do implement them. Mm -hmm. And alignment should be a generic descriptor of sorts. A person who is quote unquote chaotic good. It's it's a generic descriptor of here's some attitudes you might encounter with this person. That's really all an alignment should be at that point, unless you know the person, or in this case the character intimately, in some fashion. So you know more specifically how that alignment can be expressed in their private life or whatever. Uh, the the alignment should only be an indication of broad sweeping, uh, general activities and general mannerisms uh, but 
never should it be something that a player character should feel completely locked and restricted to, uh, nor should it be something you can use to screw over a PC with. Uh, again, the forcing uh, paladins to fall thing that we've discussed in the past. Mm -hmm. We don't. We don't want any instances of that guy. That GM. Yep. Want to keep them out of the limelight. Mm -hmm. uh, I had. Th I had thought that we'd be glossing over most of most of the most of the intro and base mechanics, but um, I don't. But given. But um, just give. Just given that, it's already clear that this is that this is not the typical affair. And when it com when it comes now the next the next aspect is the defense of tactical play, which um he had said that this won't be in the published version. It was just a aside he wrote for a group of players. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and after after going at. And this is this is not the be all end all of tactical advice, but he had said, if online forums are any indication, many people have the bewildering misconception that careful use of the mechanical aspects of the game, and this is a game, tactics in other words, occupies one end on a, of a spectrum, and that role playing, making choices that make sense for the character rather than yourself, occupies the other. I do not hold that conception. Mechanics represent the rules of a given world, and all worlds have rules. Take Gravity, for instance. If Airplanes and Earthlings was a tabletop role-playing game played by extraterrestrial life born in the vacuum of space, Gravity would be a central mechanic. It would affect the player's characters, it would shape how they interact with their fantasy world, it would not ever hinder their storytelling. Their storytelling would be told through that mechanic. Some mechanics, I agree, are not fun. I am not arguing that all mechanics must be upheld as they are written. I am hard arguing, however, that mechanics should be one agreed upon and two applied fairly to everyone. Yeah. And yeah, I ha I have seen that plenty of time. It's it's the re it's the reason why I um don't get along with the bit with the big adherence of story gaming. The argument is always that that because of, and you've probably you've probably heard this argument plenty of times. That because of the fact that there's less rules involved with certain with with certain story games or certain rules light games means that there's more options for role playing. I especially I especially hear this from Fate and PBTA um, adherents who swear by those two systems. Mm -hmm. And I don't have anything against either of those systems. But the but the idea that having less rules equals more role playing as some kind of binary is just wrong. It is not it is not a matter of opinion. It is just wrong. And then he goes a bit he goes a bit more into that airplanes and earthlings example, which um may sound a bit silly, but um. But the but the guy behind the book Play Unsafe had had done a gag of of Earth be, Earth being a, a an extensive tabletop game played by the Greek gods. Yeah. Well, and I see what his point is by using the the aliens playing airplanes and Earthlings because the aliens have always lived in the vacuum of space and the zero G. Mm-hmm. It's essentially trying to say, within the framework of the game, there are rules you may not like, but have to be used. And so you should express your, your roleplay and your game through those rules. Mm -hmm. Now, he, go, he, he goes on and says, To those who would argue that mechanics and roleplaying are on opposite ends of a spectrum, I challenge this. How can a character make choices that make sense in a story if the world has no logic or rules that guide it? The fact that gravity exists, 
always guides how we interact not only with our environment but with other people parents telling children not to play on the roof of the house for example a social encounter dic dictated by a firm and solid rule which exists it is for this reason that i do not view the use of the game's mechanics as opposed to role playing if a long sword is a more effective weapon mechanically than a club a smart character notice i didn't say player i meant character will generally choose to use a long sword in the same way that john doe chose to use a parachute before jumping out of the plane. It helps him survive, an action which made sense for his character. Now don't get me wrong, Some, sometimes people don't want to survive encounters. The old champion who stands before a horde of Silwari raiders, buying time for his son and daughter to escape the village, for example. The character knows that by the rules of this world he will die, but it's the same rules that add gravitas to his actions. He knows the outcome. He faces it anyway, but he is going to make the enemy work for his death. He draws his sword with the blade master feet. The trusty blade appears instantly in his hand. They enter his reach, fighting spirit, action surge, strength before death. He stands his ground and fights to his last breath. All these things I mentioned are mechanics within the game. They make the game fun and add role playing. In the following chapters, I will, to the best of my ability, demonstrate how you can utilize mechanics, the logic of the game, to, to, so to speak, to help you and your character be more effective in the world that they reside. Um, I think the, f I, I think there's a few, in there's a few interesting ones that I do want that I do want to cover in this. One of them is starting with the no I in group. You are necessary, you are special, but you are not an individual. And this is this is one of the things that he seems to be really um ham really na really um wanting to nail down, an emphasis on team play instead of a group of individuals. Mm -hmm. Because all all it takes is one character to survive the encounter, and the entire group lives. And what well, and while that. While death is while death is rare, if the entire party dies, everyone dies. Oh. And he said, I want you to let this way of thinking pervade your thoughts as you read through this guide and to help. I will issue a challenge to you. In combat scenarios, I want you to think of your character not as an individual, but an organ within a larger creature. Do not think, what can I do in this scenario? Think, what can we do? You're an adventuring group. Your survival is linked to your understanding of one another and your trust in one another. Act like it. You are not and never will be a castle. You're a cog in a machine far p superior to yourself. Um, then he goes a bit into the whole role thing, which is which is about knowing what you can do, knowing what you can't, what a role it, what a role is, and we and he has three examples of roles: the spike, the support, and the control. Mm -hmm. um, being comfortable with the role. Some people will prefer some roles over others. Um, fulfill, fulfilling your role, which he admits is a tricky category. Um, then, it, then the fact that in certain groups, like, a, like groups of two or three people, the jack-of-all-trades might be necessary. And, la and lastly, the myth of self-sufficiency, which I find interesting. He says, in blunt terms, self-sufficiency is a myth. Remember back to the Roman soldier who attempts to fight on his own, away from the army. He dies in most scenarios. The group protects him just as he protects the group. The same is for you. You cannot be self-sufficient in heavens and heresies. It isn't an option because, if you remember, your own survival is inexorably linked to the survival of your group. You cannot take on encounters by yourself. They are scales so that they require a party to defeat and attempting to remove... One, yourself from the group dynamic, you put both yourself and the group in danger. Remember, if the party TPKs, you do not get an a a award for being the last one standing. There is another problem with self-sufficiency. In attempting to be self-sufficient, you remove yourself from the game. This is a cooperative role-playing game. Even if you were meant to be self-sufficient, able to be self-sufficient, which you cannot, you are removing yourself from the game rather than adding to it. By being self-sufficient, you refuse to interact with your fellow players. Having said that, the myth of self-sufficiency is one that plagues most adventurers. We, for one reason or another, tend to be a mistrustful bunch, so I would like to offer this silly but helpful exercise. 
The next time you're in a combat scenario, and this will partially ruin immersion, I know, imagine that you're no longer playing your character, but instead every player is a, is a piece of a larger creature. Imagine a Power Ranger Megazord. Each time any character takes damage, imagine that HP being taken from not just the player, but the entire Megazord. When your support is targeted by the enemy, imagine that the rival Megazord is punching a weak point in your Megazord's armor. <laughs> imagine that your high AC characters as the Megazord's shield, the spikes as its sword, the controllers as its arms, grappling the giant enemy, and the supports as its systems, repairing each piece when necessary. Don't forget to include your own character into this thought experiment. It's Morphin time. <laughs> <laughs> he says, also, piss off. Don't bring the Green Ranger unless you want me to make you cry because the Green Ranger was a problem before we started working with the group. You were just helping me prove my point by mentioning him, and I don't want you to look silly. Boom. <laughs> I... Is this a bad time to mention that Toei had absolutely no faith in the whole Sixth Ranger thing taken off? Might be a bad idea. <laughs> but I say we do it anyway. Well, they did. Well, they did, and you know, and we all know how that turned out because that's now be because that's been a staple for what thirty years. Uh, I think so at this point. Mm -hmm. Oh. See, then we ha then we have a bit more detail on the sp on the spike, the support, and the control. Um, spike support and control. It's not too far removed from from the um, four roll system that was in D and D fourth edition. Um, def um, defender, striker, leader, and controller. Mm -hmm. um, you control. But it's it's not it, it's not doing exactly the same. But you have that you have a similar spirit. The the spike is the spike. I'd say is akin to the striker dealing with the dealing with problem enemies. Um, and prior and prioritizing the ugly monsters. Mm -hmm. I.e. I.e. they're going to be the ones they're going they're going to be targeting the ones that are going that are going to pose the bigger threats. Getting ri getting yeah. ri getting rid of them faster. Yeah. The support. Oh, it's 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 your it's your leader types. Your e the ones that are healing and the ones that are buffing. So you, the targets that you're prioritizing are your allies. Um, and the and the control role is is more about the more about the person who deals with the mobs. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, and then uh, know your positioning, and they say treat position as a stat. Treat it just like HP or defense. Use your movement to gain position so you can start controlling the battle far more effectively. Uh, and the fact that a frontline character is wasted in the backline, and so and so on. Yeah. And then he he goes into the myth of the pure tank. Okay, I hear you say, I'll be a frontliner and I'll only pick defensive abilities which target myself. No. There's no such thing as a pure tank. You might have been scratching your head when you heard when you saw my description of roles. Where's the tank? You might have thought. As a frontliner, you need to give an enemy a reason to hit you. If every ability you have only targets yourself and only makes you more defensive, why would an enemy ever target you? Imagine this. A character class which is immune to all damage has all attacks automatically miss it in combat, but cannot otherwise act in combat or the aftermath of combat. Is this class good? No, it's not. An enemy can, and even a dumb enemy will, ignore this class since it does not provide a threat. In order to be a frontliner, you still need to threaten the enemy. This, still, this means you need to fulfill one of the three roles in addition to being a little extra durable. You need, you need to give the enemy a reason to target you, and it's for this reason you cannot only take defensive abilities for yourself. Remember, there is no I in group. Um, and even even backliners don't shouldn't be shouldn't be um, prioritizing def shouldn't be prioritizing defense in that regard. And they can take a hit and make sure to let the front line do its job. Um, the third step that he goes into is action economy. Mm-hmm. And, and again, then, yeah, and then says, "Here be numbers; ye be warned." 
and go and goes into the goes into the goes into a bit of the math of how, of how to do it um and i know i know i'm i know i'm skimming over a lot of this but i do think i do think this is a very fascinating read for someone to do on their own time because i know that i know that he said that this is not going to be in the final the final um book I would I would actually argue that this should be that this should be in the first chapter. This should be in the introduction chapter. Yeah. If 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 not in the introduction chapter, I feel like a lot of the things in here should be spread around throughout the book. Especially th especially things like the jack of all trades, the myth of self-sufficiency and the there is no such thing as a pure tank. Mhm. Mm um now the last part of this particular tr this particular um, trinity that we're going to be going into is ancestries and backgrounds. Um, now ancestries are are effectively the equivalent of race, um, and one and and one and one might one might say, well, why why am I perfectly fine with ancestries here when I kept when I kept when I um when I criticized. I criticize certain other games for switching for switching ancest for switching ancestry from race. The reason the reason for the reason for that is is um the, is the fact that in a, in a lot of cases that that did that did this whole we don't use race anymore we use ancestry. For all intents and purposes, they're still using race as in the same rules that it would have been previously. It they is. also uh, more often used uh, heritage or lineage over uh, ancestry. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, um, it is we are ch there. It's very cl it's very clear from earlier on that these particular ancestries are playing a bigger part than normal. It's not a case of an ability modifier and maybe a couple features. And dark vision because way too many, way too many classes, way too many um, races have dark have dark vision. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we ha but what we have here. So what? So the components are the uh, maximum HP. Because some some ancestries like dwarves are going to be more durable than others, base fortitude score, um, proficiency bo proficiency bonus, which scales which scales based on which scales on level, base defenses, ability score array, features and feats, and po or potential feats. So we're do we have something with the five E framework that, that that actually gives a shit about feats. And the f the first one, the first ancestry we have is dwarves, uh, which in this case are the standard start, um, descended from giants kind of thing. Yeah. And and we have, as far as, I think I think the other reason that they that they did the ancestries thing is because there's di is because of the different types listed here. We have earth dwarves, stone dwarves, fire dwarves, frost dwarves, st and storm dwarves. And let's see. Quite a bit of dwarves. And I do dwarf 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 dwarf. Mm -hmm. And then we have the tra the traits by the traits by level. Proficiency goes about how I'd expect it to. Um, I do like that we're doing the return of bonus feats every four levels instead of that instead of that being a uh, instead of that being a swap for ASI. No, in this case we do both. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and then we have the ability score array table. Which I know, which I'm pretty sure, which some people may end up crying foul about. I personally don't mind it. Um, then we have ba um, base defenses. 
for e for each ability score. And I I do remember some I do remember someone talking about the idea that um that instead of using three instead of using saving throws, there should be um a, that each each ability score should gen should generate its equivalent saving throw. And it looks like that's what we've got here. Um, and then feet then features. So bo bonus proficiencies, um, a bo a bonus a bonus feat, and then listing the listing the feats that can be chosen. Can e they can either get resilient, tough, durable, or a feat from their ancestry list. Mm -hmm. um, and steadfast steadfast march. So encumbrance of armor does not count against your carrying capacity. Um, movement Very nice. speed is not reduced with tower shields. And carrying capacity increases by two if you're not wearing any armor. Um, and tenacious, you can expend vitality in order to roll a resolve check with advantage. Um, not today. When an enemy hits you with an attack, you may grant yourself resistance to that attack's damage. If that attack would also impose a condition on you, you may have the severity of that condition. You must push forward or rest in order to use this feature again. I feel like the I feel like the push forward thing is kind is kind of kind of doing a workaround to that to one of the big burrs up our ass when it came to fifth edition's design and a lot of the design in level up. The mm -hmm. whole, you can only use this once per sh once per short or long rest. Yeah. Now in this case, you, you we still technically have that here, but you have but you have a way to cheat the system. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Then, a then ASI. Um, and what? So one thing. One thing that I I notice is that there are certain catches with ASI. Um, like at third level, you can't increase your highest ability score. Um. At seventh level, you in, you increase your highest, so it's like every other one you either increase either increase one of the, one that's one that isn't your highest ability score, or one that is. Uh huh. Which which means that you're not gonna have a, you're not gonna have a case where somebody's dumping it all into one stat. Yeah, because dumping is actually. Uh almost penalized in this respect. Mm -hmm. See, then we have, unfortunately, the elves. Maybe these elves are better than usual. Oh, let's see. They've got... They only, they only get... They only start with 12 HP instead of, six, instead of 16 of the dwarves, which I expected. Um... And let's see, we have we have we have the whole thing with bo with um bon with bonus feats. They have dark <clears throat> vision, of course. Um, God God touched. Choose either strength, constitution, or dex. Your choice must ma must match one of your core abilities. You can expend a fortitude point in order to roll an ability check of the chosen ability with advantage. Let me see when they get. Oh, a lot of these they're getting out of the gate. Um, trance, which which is like it, which is a case of you only need four hours instead instead of eight instead of eight. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see ASI and bo and bonus feet. I I do think that there's a better spread of features than nor than normal. Um, let's see Felborn, which I think I think is supposed to be our um. Our version of Tiefling, hmm. and let's see, they have de they have um de demonia. So if you were to take damage from a spell, you can expend vitality in order to gain resistance to that instance of the spell's damage. Eldric impulse, you can attune one additional magic item. Infernal intuition, you can expend a vitality. In order to roll an intuition check with advantage. Um, interesting, and a ASI and bo and bonus feats. 
Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, then gnomes. And so we're, I feel like I feel like with these kind of gnomes, we're doing the more Warcraft gnomies. Steampunk. Well, it, talk, it talks about technology and and ob, and obsolescence. For many gnomes, progress and innovation are the only true goals. For this reason, many gnomes relinquish all ties to tradition. It is for this reason that gnomes no longer bear a sharp distrust for planar magics. Like all other magics, they are a different lens with which to view the world. For most gnomes, obsolescence is a part of innovation. To make a technology obsolete is to discover a better one. This view leads many gnomes to, sometimes accidentally, worship the god Engi, god of knowledge and discovery. Engi, real cute. This focus on progress mm -hmm. can, at times, obscure ethical boundaries, and some gnomes have a reputation for being hyper-analytical and lacking empathy. While this stereotype is not accurate for most norms, many feel that logic, reason, and most importantly, progress are loftier principles than emotionally under emotional understanding and acceptance. Um, I should note one one thing that I like with the whole ability score arrays with these is that it's not setting what your what your core stats are going to be. You still have to assign. I um. I could see this pissing off certain certain folks that are more traditional because of the fact that you're not rolling your ability scores, but I don't I don't mind this. Mm -hmm. Since let's be honest, when people when people are trying to roll their ability scores, they are they they re, they are very much wanting to go, wanting to go all in on um on, tr on trying to roll as many 18s as possible. Yeah. That's definitely true. Um, let's see. Then we have... So they first... So they have invisible... It seems that they... It seems that they don't have in... When it comes to their bonus feats, it's all in their ancestry feats, which... Um, there's pr they're probably gonna, they're probably going to get a few that a few that aren't, um, but then we have invisibility glyph, which immediately after you take damage you can expend a fortitude to become magically invisible until the end of your next turn as a free action. While invisible, you do not provoke attacks of opportunity due to leaving an enemy's threatened space. Well, rogue time. Yep. <laughs> Um, Tinkerer is next. Choose a resonance from among the list of resonances. Whenever you find a material of a different resonance, you may you may consider that material to be also to also have resonance of the same type. Um, we'll probably end up get we'll probably end up getting into what resonance is once we get to equipment. Let's see, quick, totally. quick witted can roll a wits expend fortitude to roll a wits check with advantage, and then ASI and bo and bonus feats. Wait, is bonus feed in there twice? Oh, they. Oh, they get one of their ancestry feats at the start for free, and then there's the bonus feat as they level up. My bad. Let's see, then we have halflings. Who get who? Let's see, they. So as far as their abilities, they're getting, um, fury of the small. The threat range for critical hits on attacks against creatures larger than you increases by one. <laughs> so long so long as you could critically hit against the target. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> I just love that name though. It may, it almost makes me feel bad for picking on everyone shorter than us. Almost. Almost. I knew it. Let's see, otherworldly demeanor, attack. Attacks made to enthrall or confuse you are made with disadvantage. All right, nimbleness. You can move. You can move through the space of any creature that is of a size larger than yours. Though you cannot end your turn in another creature's space unless you could normally end a turn in its space. Let's see, then ASI and bo and bonus feats. Then we have Humies. Let's see if we go with that whole jack of all trade jack of all trades shtick that that often happens with humans. 
certainly hope not. So, we have ambition. Oh, oh, wow. First of all, I'd like to say, humans are the oldest of the races? What? That's a bit different. Yeah, usually humans are the youngest race. Newest on the scene, usually, yeah. But so let's see. Let's see. Let's see, we have ambitious, an additional f you get one, which is their bonus feat. Learned, you gain simple proficiency with all weapons, proficiency with light armor and light shields, or proficiency in an artistry. Um, half blooded, you can choose from and and this is optional. You can choose from the ancestry feats of one other ancestry. If you do so, you cannot choose any human-specific ancestry feats, and cannot choose feats from your chosen ancestry, which allows, which rely on features you don't have. And we have survivability, gives you a, gives you a boost to vitality at first level, fifth, eleventh, and seventeenth. Um, and we have a bit. We have the whole thing with a, with ASI and bonus feats. Let's see, then we have. Um, Orukai, and <laughs> these are not these are not the these are clearly not the typical orcs. Yeah, they're not. Um, I know I know that some people are like, well, you are trying to do the whole thing of Tolkien's orcs are ra are are ra are racism, which um tells tells me more about those people who are making those arguments than it than it does about Tolkien, honestly. Yeah. But it says Orukai are a result of com from communication with the divine, which is a particularly taxing feat. For this reason, Orukai have over the years grown larger than many of the other ancestries, and many of them are able to communicate with commune with the divine at will. Um, would it be fair to say that this is more in line with um, Warcraft orcs? In a way, yeah. yeah it's, but but regardless, let's see. So what? So we get we after the proficiencies and feet, um, and given the fact that Warcaster is one of their feats, I'm I'm guessing I'm not far off on that whole Warcraft influence. See, dark vision. They have the dark vision. Yeah. yeah. So far, we've only seen two races that have dark vision, which is interesting to me. Let's see, it makes sense. You don't want everybody to have dark vision because then it just isn't that special. Yep. Let's see. Then headhunter. Whenever you roll for an attack with advantage, instead of rolling two d twenty dice, you can and taking the highest roll, you may roll you may roll a single d twenty and increase the threat range of of that attack by four. What? You essentially get to, as part of your feat, get increase your threat range to 15 through 20? No, 16 through 20. Given 16, the 17, 18, 18, 20, yeah. Given the, fa given the fact that... Um, actually, this may seem overpowered, but I think I, I, think I get where the logic is going. Um, no, I, I know it's not overpowered because you're still only rolling one die and, and you still have a chance to fail pretty badly, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's any time you have advantage, you can choose to forego your advantage to try and get an increased critical range. Yep. Like, this is, this is peak crit fishing. So if you want to be a crit fisher, or Ukai may be your, your, uh, your choice there. Mm-hmm. Or or he or ha, or a half or an orakai who or a um human who has who has taken um mix, who has taken mixed heritage. True, true. Uh, for the next one, it goes, divine fury is the next one. When attack would would reduce you to zero hit points, you may use your reaction to make one attack of opportunity. You do not suffer from the dispirited condition while making this attack. 
you may not use this feature if you've used it in the previous round. Um, seems like a fuck you button. It's a it's a fuck you button, and uh, it makes sure that because um, when you go to zero uh, zero HP, you you hit dispirited. Um, it makes sure that this one AOO is not affected by dispirited, mm -hmm. which is nice, especially if you somehow combine it with headhunter. Somehow getting drink his AOO. That that would be funny as hell. Somebody thinks they've knocked you out, and then they end up. But they, but they end up falling down a flight of punches. <laughs> Hold on, let me let me see if this was actually covered. Um... You're look you're looking up the dispirited condition. I'm guessing. Uh, well, when it's outside of the dispirited condition. Um. But yes, yeah, so I'm looking up dispirited and a why is a this not found, working? No, I, f I found it. A creature is dispirited if it is conscious if it is conscious at zero hit points. A dispirited creature suffers disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. A creature that has at least one hit point is no longer dispirited unless another attack is inflicting this condition on it. Yeah. I'm looking for... Ah, and, and here's here it is. Attacks of opportunity. In a fight, everyone is constantly watching for a chance to strike an enemy who is fleeing or passing by. Such a strike is called an opportunity attack. You, may, you can make an opportunity attack when a hostile creature that you can see moves out of your reach. To make the opportunity attack, you must use your reaction to make one melee attack against the provoking creature. The attack occurs right before the creature re leaves your reach. Yep. So, so it's an opportunity attack um, that doesn't have disadvantage, and if you can also somehow give yourself advantage at the same time, uh, you can then turn it into a headhunter. Mm -hmm. That would be hilarious. I would laugh my ass off if I ever got to pull that off. Yep, and then we have other fo the last race that we have is other folk. Or or Haru E. Um. Ha 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 ha! <laughs> I fucking I already said there was a bunch of weeb shit in here. I'd also I'd also like to to note that this is the least uh the least uh developed. Mm -hmm. Because this guy is, the dev note says, this ancestry is generally used by people who want to make their own ancestry. I still need to add descriptions to various parts of it. Yeah. Let's see, then we... Then we have we have the features. So we have bonus proficiencies, AS, ASI, bonus feet. Then we have senses. Choose one of the following options. Dark vision, echolocation... And perceptive. Let's see, in other folk movement, either choose climber, athletic, or swimmer as bonus feats, and you don't have to meet the prerequisites of those feats. Then, then for Sorry. defenses, you have natural defense, so you get one point of damage reduction. Evasive, you gain one point of deflection, and elemental resistance. You gain resistance. A resistance of your one elemental type, yeah. yeah. See, and then other additional other additional features. Um, this is the special ability. You can choose one of the options from this list or from the senses, movement, or defense list. You cannot choose the same option twice. You have tooth and nail. You gain simple proficiency in unarmed strikes. If you gain simple proficiency with unarmed strikes from another feature later, you gain martial proficiency instead. If you hit with an unarmed strike, you may choose to deal slashing or piercing damage rather than bludgeoning damage, and your unarmed attacks deal one arm plus one damage. This is how you create a Khajiit. Mm -hmm. um, land on all fours. You are skilled at landing on your feet. Your climb speed increases by five, by five feet. 
Your falling damage threshold increases by 10 feet. You have resistance to bludgeoning damage resulting from falling. If an attack were to knock you prone, you may use your reaction in order to jump back on your feet. So, I mean, it's everything a cat does plus an ukemi. Mm -hmm. You get an ukemi. That's nice. Yep. Let's see, and then natural weapons. You may choose two melee weapon types from the equipment section. As a free action, you may use your limbs as weapons with the same characteristics of the chosen weapons. You, mu you have simple proficiency with these weapons, but must otherwise fulfill their requirements. For example, you may, you may use one of your arms as a heavy blade, but must use your free hand to stabilize it in order to properly wield it. <laughs> what? I'm just gonna grab my arm right here, and then when I punch you, I hit you like a great sword with slashing damage. Oh. If you were to gain simple proficiency with these we with these weapons from a feat or class ability, for example, later you gain martial proficiency instead. Um, when it co when it comes to when it comes to that whole using your arms as a heavy blade thing, I feel like I feel like that was put in there to kind to kind of discourage someone from going. Why don't I just have a bunch of limbs and all of them are heavy blades? But. Well, you you could still have a bunch of limbs, and half of them are heavy blades, and the other half stabilize them. But ev even so, um, you can only pick one feature from this list. Well, there's one last feature. Yeah. And the last one is long-limbed. Your melee reach is increased by five feet on your turn. There's another thing you can do if you don't want to do a spear build. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to use lunge. Let's see then we have um bet we have backgrounds which another which does seem to be some something to that is being expand is expanded especially given the whole cast thing that we have here where you're, you're choosing a background and a cast so the casts are laborers who get proficiency in additional skill warriors and explorers who can o who only have to miss twice in order to get combat focus instead of three times Artisans, <coughs> who gain proficiency in additional artistry, of course, and nobles, who gain one tier of expertise in any one skill that they have proficiency in. Let's see, and then cho then choosing the, your upbringing, which, depending on whether it's physically demanding, mentally demanding, or rounded, you'll get a bonus to co to core physical, mental, or or your, lo non -core. or your lowest non-core. Um, let's see. Then reputation. So this is this is this is a this upbringing thing is actually really interesting because uh, you can either go for a very spiky build or a very consistent build. Mm -hmm. Let's see. That uh, reputation starts at tier one. And it and it looks like it looks like there's the whole there's a whole thing of coming up with a reputation with the with the player and GM's input. Then bo then bonus feet and fi and finishing touches. So you're granted, so you're granted one bonus feet and one and one bonus tier one materials slash currency. says uh you can choose any feat from any category as long as you meet the requirements but you should probably choose a feat relevant to your background mm -hmm. and uses the specific example of a nobleman with a physically taxing upbringing might take the blade mastery feat having been taught the art of the sword from a variety of learned instructors instructors hired by his family to teach him mm -hmm. um i I personally think I personally think that thi that um this set this particular setup is far as is far more interesting and is far more as far more potential combinations than either the vanilla background setup <laughs> mm -hmm. sorry 
or um, the level up version. Now the level, yeah, the level up, up version had a was trying for a bit more thematics, but this one is get this one is giving the thematic tools to the to the uh, players. Mm -hmm. And making them making them not just thematic but also mechanical. Like long limbed is one of the other kin feature, uh, features. You could say that you're an ape person, and so you want long limbed because you're an ape person, and apes ch tend to have pretty long arms. But it also gives you a mechanical advantage of, hey, I've got long reach too. So my ape person is now a monk that uses burning hands to continue our ever evolving joke. <laughs> and it, it, ir irony that I say evolving with an ape. Uh, General Grodd, anybody? <clears throat> uh, anyway, uh, and you know, you, you now have the punchy monk with burning hands and long arms, so now he can hit you from ten feet away instead of five. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now I'm just imagining King Louis punching people with his hands on fire. <laughs> The strangest shit that goes through my head. I in, I encourage dumb shit builds, so I'm not so I'm not gonna pass judgment. <laughs> dumb shit builds are fun. Oh, and because the the thing with when I saw when I saw the introduction of backgrounds in Five E, it felt like to me those backgrounds felt like it was trying to be a poor man's version of Fate's aspects. Yeah, because uh, when you when you stop and think about it, what is a bat? What the the only thing that backgrounds really give you, um, aside aside from aside from those aside from that set of ta that set of tables, which are possibly me possibly inspiration fodder, but it's dependent on GM fiat. Mm -hmm. It really only get it really only gives you a few proficiencies. Yeah. Like you'll get one, Where's... you'll get maybe a weapon proficiency and may, and maybe a um tool maybe maybe a tool proficiency and maybe a, a couple um, skill proficiencies, yeah. which is is cute and is cute and all, but ultimately it ultimately because of that you end you're gonna end up with situations where um you still have this even if some even if somebody's backstory is different if they have the same background they are getting the same stuff. Yeah. Whereas this, the, the backgrounds are broad, very broad. Uh, but that's also because now the 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 broad, the broadness of them is is there to give uh, attention to the fact that yeah, all of these laborers are going to get this one type of thing, but this one type of thing has many choices within it, mm -hmm. and you can still tailor it. To whatever backstory you've given yourself, especially if you choose to to then say, "Well, I was, you know, a stable worker uh, uh, within big city, uh, big city in stable hand," you know, so you've had a physically hard uh, life as a, as a laborer at a, at a at a large in in a city. You can you can just from that alone you can uh, you can kind of begin to see how you would build this person uh with their what maybe maybe you'll choose maybe you'll choose a human just for versatility or maybe you'll choose uh you know one of one of the gnomes because he's uh, only working as a stable hand cuz he he needs to he's trying to invent a better saddle mm -hmm. <laughs> there's endless possibilities with how broad it is and that broadness gives freedom to microscope down and make the choices you want to make. Mm -hmm. And as we always say, player choice, more of it. I will I will always I will always take more choice over less. So long as the choices mean something. So long as the choices are not empty. Or or do or doing the whole paralysis thing. Paralysis is more a uh, a factor of someone not knowing how to narrow choices more than the amount of choices they're given. 
I um I like to refer to it as as knowing as knowing not to have not to throw people into um swim, damn it. Yes. Helping guide them into a way that helps them naturally find the way to narrow choices is much better, that's true. Mm -hmm. You and I are so experienced at this point that choice paralysis really isn't a thing for us. It's it's only it's only ever, it's only ever it's only ever a thing in um in set in setups that are poor are poorly explained. There there can st there can still be a degree of choice paralysis in say universal style games, especially if I'm di especially if I'm going through um hero or GURPS. It's not as and bad GURPS, as it, Jesus Christ. It's not as bad as it used to be, but truth but truth be told, those two are systems that. If I can help it, I try and avoid. Yeah, universal systems tend to be a little. <sighs> it's it's one of the it's one of those things that it just requires more work for me. Yeah. Um. There are ex there are exceptions to this rule. Um, stuff like Besom or mm -hmm. stuff or stuff like Savage Worlds, I don't have that problem as much. How did I know you were going to mention both of those? <laughs> um as well as well as cortex although cortex's universalness is up for debate um mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm not sure if i can and when it comes to when it comes to wine i'm not entirely sure if i'd consider that a universal system as much as much as a as much as a collection of modular subsystems but Fine. what's old is new. Oh, I, I call that one. Um, <laughs> I was like, we must be. I I thought it might be what's old is new, but I just you know. But given but given that um, now so far we've only covered the base mechanics and race races and backgrounds, but. So far, I, f I feel I feel that this first dip into what Heavens and Heresies wants to be is impressive. It is, and it and it fills me with the same the same feeling that I felt at the beginning of the Level Up Five E uh, documents. The mm -hmm. same inspiration to the point that I'm legitimately considering playing a D twenty system again. <laughs> now. Next next week we'll next week we'll be getting into we'll be getting into the structure for the for the class system and the and the classes themselves and this is going to be the we're not going to get through all the classes next week obviously but we'll tr we'll try and get through at least one at least one. Um, uh, I would like to point one last thing out, Monk. Uh, something we didn't really cover extremely well, but that. Uh, is kind of permeated throughout, especially the ancestries and backgrounds area. Mm -hmm. uh, we we've always had an issue with D and D not uh, either either shitting or getting off the pot when it comes to setting. You know that it mm -hmm. that, that it that it tries to be setting agnostic, but it's very clear that D and D's rules imply at least some subgroup of settings. Um, this this game is very much explicitly within a specific setting. Yeah, um, and that's the Mirari, mm -hmm. uh, which is just the name for the for the mortal plane, the material world. Yeah, the reason the reason why I glossed over the, why I glossed over that is this, is there's not a whole lot to dissect when it comes to that setting itself. This is true, but we can see from how the ancestries are built. And the type of flavor that was shown with them, that this setting is very much alive, has its own identity, and the game is fully within it. Um, that is going to be a that is go, that is that could potentially be a double-edged sword if somebody wants to use this to do it to do it to do their own generic fantasy setup. But truth be told, a smart enough player is gonna fig is gonna figure out a way to do that. Yeah. There's always going to be people like you and I out there who go, well, we could use this for something generic fantasy and still make it work really well. Um, but I really like the fact that it has its identity. Mm -hmm. It knows where it is, and it and it makes no qualms about that. 
And I'm pretty sure we're especially going to see that when we get the spells later on. I am so looking forward to that phase, Monk. You have no idea. Just from what we saw in the base stuff with, uh, with, with spell, how spell attacks work. Mm -hmm. I want to see the full thing. <laughs> Yeah, but we, but we've got uh, we've got to stick to the plan. So ne next next week will be classes, um, and of course, and um, we'll and we'll be we'll be doing those in alphabetical order. And there's going to be quite a few because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve classes, a dirty dozen. I like it. Mm -hmm. I I want I want more. more. I uh I can say right now Tanner has done a good job. Yep. But that is going to do it for this particular journey through the Valley of the Judged. We'll be back here next Friday with the, with our dive into classes. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>